I'm really in, excited to introduce this speaker because she's a, an alumna of our group and she's come back to give this sem seminar. So it was really great. Um, our speaker is Teresa Grunninger. Um, Teresa currently works as an aquatic species program specialist at the Great Lakes Commission. Um, she started out getting a bachelor's degree from Bowling Green State University. After that, she bounced around from a few internships um, in the Northeast and in the Gulf of Mexico, and she worked on a variety of topics um, from shorebirds to whales to seagrasses. And luckily, she liked seagrasses because after the, those series of internships, she came to the University of Florida, did a master's degree in seagrasses, and that's the work that you're going to hear about um, today. She was also really instrumental in some, some other projects um, in my lab group um, and with Savannah as well. Um, we did a, a project with um, folks all over the Caribbean um, um, looking at seagrass herbivory and predation, and Teresa led a really important side project um, for our group um, um, with that project. After leaving um, UF, she moved back to Michigan and has worked at the, as a contractor for USGS, looking at um, invasive species, particularly Phragmites and wetlands. And now she um, continues doing some of that work, but in a different setting, um, again, at a, at a, at a more in a consulting role. Um, one of the cool things, if you look at Teresa's CV, is that um, in all of these positions, she did a lot of outreach and education. Um, she worked uh, works a lot with the public and also with folks who are making decisions about ecosystem management and restoration. And I think that will show you um, not only that she's devoted to, to outreach, but it also... Um, um, I think drives a lot of the questions that she that she worked on at, in her master's, and she'll present to you today as well. Um, when I when I talk about um, um, prop scars to to folks in this region, we often talk about the um, the issues that Teresa worked on as part of her master's. So I'm excited for you to hear about that. Um, so thank you, Teresa, for coming back and presenting this work to us, and thank you all for being here. And with that, I will turn it over to Teresa. Thank you, Laura. That was such a nice introduction. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay. Does that look good for everybody? Okay. So, uh, hi, I'm Teresa. And as Lauren mentioned, I am going to be presenting my master's work that I did at the University of Florida. Um, so I'm super excited to talk about it. I now work more with um, freshwater aquatic species up here in the Great Lakes region, and I don't get to talk about seagrass as much as I would love. So <laughs> here's my chance to like um, talk about it with you guys, and I'm really happy to present this work. Um, I want to acknowledge that, of course, like any graduate degree, it's not just me. I had a lot of help from my advisor, Laura, who just introduced me, as well as Savannah, who's on this call, who's one of my committee members, and was helped set up one of the projects I'll be talking about of the um, predation study and then my other uh, committee member, Charlie Martin. <clears throat> um, so I've been to a few of these webinar talks, some of the previous ones, and I know there's been a lot of talks in this webinar focused on seagrass. So I won't spend too much time talking about, you know, why it's important and the benefits of it, but it felt weird not to have a slide about it. So. Um, we all know that there's these really great benefits that the seagrass habitats provide to the region. And many of these go to benefits that we talk about also carry like a very large global value. So if we think of fisheries production um, and habitat providing that could be estimated at like 33 billion um, a year and sequestering carbon at 7 billion, nutrient cycling 1.9 trillion per year and preventing coast erosion, which is really important um, in this region, 81.2 billion. Um, so obviously there's a lot of reasons why we want to keep seagrass habitat around and protect them, um, especially in the Florida region. <clears throat> so what role does, if we're kind of thinking about seagrass as a whole, but on a smaller scale, what role does structure have when we think about like healthy seagrass habitats? When I was thinking about doing my thesis and looking at previous work, there's a lot of work and a lot of research about how seagrass structure um, and what it is to 
and what it adds to an otherwise bare sediment floor and how that affects the ecosystem. So you've probably all heard a lot of these topics, you know, how seagrass affects predation success or influence the animal behavior, um, what habitat use does it provide to species? How does it influence sediment deposition, a hydrodynamic regime? All of these really overarching topics. But a lot of times these are really talked about on a large landscape level scale. So something as seagrass is here, seagrass isn't here, or maybe in terms of large landscape level fragmentation. <clears throat> But not much is really known about the effects of fragmentation of seagrass on a small spatial scale. So one of the common examples of this would be um, small scale fragmentation is propeller scarring. So we see here from this image, we have a propeller scar cutting through a meadow and it's just making like a tiny little area of no, no seagrass. <clears throat> you may be wondering, does, you know, like on the scheme of things, does propeller scarring though really even matter? Um, so. You've probably seen this image before, but in Florida's Big Bend, we know that this is a really great region for seagrass meadows. Um, there's low development, great water quality, um, low phosphorus, amazing uh, clarity, and therefore we have really large expansive seagrass meadows in this area. So despite that these meadows are very healthy, maybe in comparison to other regions around the world, propeller scars in the area are common and do represent a large preventable decline in habitat. <clears throat> Okay, for those who might not be so familiar, you may be wondering what a prop scar is. So just a quick overview, so we, so we all are on the same page. These are caused when boat propellers make contact with the sea floor. So this leads to removal of the above ground, um, often the below ground structure too of the seagrass itself. Um, this process creates deep trench-like scars that are around maybe five to 10 centimeters deep. And as we see in this photo, this leads to a fragmentation of a habitat and increases the habitat edge. And unfortunately, the growth of seagrass back into these scars is often really slow, um, especially for slow growing species like the Lassia, which is common here in this region. Um, previous research has estimated that it takes about seven to 10 years to fill a scar back in. <clears throat> so in the meantime, we kind of had these bare sediment areas and oftentimes they kind of fill with transient detrital matter such as dead seagrass leaves or drift algae accumulates in them. Okay. Right. Well, I know propeller scars are not a new topic. They've kind of, you know, they're part of research for quite a few years. Um, there's a lot we still really kind of don't know about them. So there's these large knowledge gaps that we have. So, you know, how are the ecosystem processes being impacted at the scar level itself? So processes such as animal behavior and predation rates really haven't been previously addressed. Um, and as I mentioned in the last slide, it creates these trenches that kind of kind of fill in with transient detrital matter. We don't really have a good idea of how that detrital presence affects the habitat or changes any um, ecosystem processes. And, you know, does scarring change sediment competition, composition, excuse me, um, or nutrient stores, and are propeller scars dramatic enough to cause a reduction in any of these um, nutrient, nutrient storage? And all in all, I think these processes are important to address so we can kind of fully understand the effects that propeller scarring has and maybe eventually get an idea if there's like a tipping point. You know, after so much scarring density in an area, are we eventually losing any form of habitat functionality? <clears throat> so, as part of my thesis, we kind of looked at three different areas, um, and these are the topics that I'm going to present in this uh, presentation today. So I'm first going to start with, um, we looked at faunal density and community assemblage of propeller scars. Next, we looked at grazing and protection potential, and then lastly, sediment composition and nutrient pools. All right. So the study location for this project was off of Crystal River. Um, and I've seen actually from a, quite a few of these past presentation webinars that we've all used the same study area. So I'm sure many of you guys are probably really familiar with this, um, but I, they were specifically, we focused, focused at scars within two different areas. So the first location that I'm gonna be calling is called Sandy Hook. And Sandy Hook, if you see from this, is a small little island. Um, it's in a shallow, kind of area and as a really popular fishing destination. 
Um, so unfortunately, because of the shallow water, boats coming in, boats coming out, there's a lot of scars surrounding this little area. And the second location is what I'm going to be calling Fish Creek. And Fish Creek is a seagrass meadow um, kind of that surrounds a relatively deep channel that extends further offshore. So it's hard to tell from this Google image, but like there's a little channel here, which is extending out. Um, so it's used by local boaters. It's kind of maybe not an amazing, well-marked channel. People kind of cut in and out. Um, therefore, there's really, you know, some pretty decent sized scarring around this area. Um, both of the sites are dominated by thalassia with occasional syringodium or manatee grass in the area. Um, and the dimensions of the scar, the ones that we looked at um, ranged from about 29 to 70 centimeters wide. Um, so they varied obviously with the boat that is creating the scar. And here's just a really nice image of what the seagrass meadow looks like. So this is at Fish Creek and we can see like just beautifully dense, healthy thalassia beds. <clears throat> Um, I also want to note, so it's kind of hard to tell with like how close these little squares are on the map, but these two sites are actually pretty different. So Fish Creek is the one that's further offshore. Um, it had higher water depths and also the site visibility was all around just really fantastic. In Sandy Hook, the average depths were much shallower. It's closer inshore um, and there was also pretty high turbidity levels, which further on, you know, we looked at videos, footage, so this had a bit big impact. Um, due to these site differences, many of the analyses that I'm going to present were separated by site. So just to explain why that is. Okay, so I'm first going to start off talking about faunal differences. So here's just a brief um, methods of how we go, went about collecting this. So at both of these sites that I mentioned, Sandy Hook and Fish Creek, we evaluated at the faunal and infaunal communities through collected hand cores. So we took um, cores at three different habitat types for samples. So we have bear propeller scars, detrital filled propeller scars, and then the adjacent intact reference meadow. Um, it's important to note that detrital filled scars, despite our best look for searching, were only found at the Sandy Hook site. Therefore, faunal cores from the Fish Creek site only have the two um, rep, uh, habitat types. <clears throat> so reference cores were then collected about five meters away from a propeller scar in all cores were sieved um, with a 1.5 millimeter uh, spat bag and then fauna was identified down to species. And just like a brief uh, biology 101 overview, I'm going to be talking about epifauna and infauna separately. So in case you forgot, epifauna is uh, organisms that are living on the surface of either sediment or in this case, the seagrass itself. Um, so that's a lot of times we're going to see like amphipods um, and anything that's like on the grass, sometimes, sometimes mollusks and stuff like that. And then infauna is anything living in the sediment. So we have a lot of polychaetes and burrowing clams and those type of species. And then here's just a visual image of the kind of the difference of what we're talking about when I'm talking about a bear scar or the detrital filled scar. Um, so this first image is not from our lab. I just took that offline, but that is what I'm talking about. When we're talking about a bear scar. It's seagrass on the sides and just plain sand sediment in the middle. And these detrital filled scars, you can see look very different. So in this image, you can't really even see the sand. You can tell it's covered in dead thalassia leaves. <clears throat> okay, so um, for these graphs here, I want to note that we have on the y-axis is fauna density um, as individuals per meter squared. And then the top two graphs here are going to be for in fauna only, and the bottom two are representative of epifauna. Um, and the colors here for the key with the bright green being the reference meadow, the um, darker green representing the scar with the tritus, and the gray as the bear scar. Um, these color schemes are going to be consistent throughout. So um, learn them, I guess, now. <laughs> and uh, what we found was overall scarring did have an absolute effect on faunal density, but the presence of the detrital matter within the scar definitely kind of mitigated these impacts. So at both sites, 
Sandy Hook and Frisch Creek, we see that epifauna was significantly lower here in the gray, which is the bear scar, compared to the reference meadow, um, and then as well as the scar with detritus. And what's interesting at Sandy Hook is basically the scar with detritus and the reference were pretty much identical. Like they had really relatively close um, epifauna density. And we also see a similar trend with infauna. So at Fish Creek, we have the infauna is significantly lower than the reference meadow. At Sandy Hook, it's not significant, but we do see that it is drastically lower and follows, follows a similar trend. Um, and the trend is also similar with the scar with the tritus. So we have these two reference scar with the tritus, very similar to each other in terms of infaunal density. <clears throat> Um, another, so we have density, another important thing to look at is actually species diversity. So easy enough, we looked at diversity um, by treatment. Um, note for these graphs in our analyses, we actually combined epifauna and fauna together. So we used the basic Shannon Viner diversity index. So the index increases as richness and evenness of the community increases. So here on the Y axis, um, the higher the number, um, correlates to higher diversity of the treatment. Um, so again, I'll start kind of with Sandy Hook because it's the one with three treatments. We see that the bear scar again had significantly lower diversity compared to the other two um, treatment habitats. And then we have um, the reference and the scar with detritus again, kind of following pretty close to each other, not that far behind. And then at Fish Creek, the bear scar was not significantly lower, but um, it still kind of followed the same trend of having less diversity than the reference site. <clears throat> so we also got to look at um, differences in community composition, which was really cool between the treatments. So differences between the communities were assessed by comparing a break Curtis dissimilarity indices um, which is an output of a simper analysis. And uh, I'm just going to explain it because I always kind of mess myself up. It's to me, at least, it's not necessarily intuitive. So the closer the indices is to zero, that means two sites had the same composition or they shared basically all the same species. And the closer it is to 100, a full 100 being the two treatment habitats shared zero of the same species. So um, I just just going to remind that because I, I get them backwards all the time. So just looking at these two graphs, so again, we have our two different sites, Sandy Hook and Fish Creek. We see the comparing the reference to the detrital field scar here is the 63.01 that had the highest. Um, that means that they um, were the closest, as I said, it's opposite. So the closer to zero. So they had the most similar um, species composition, which makes sense, which is what we were seeing both in terms of diversity and density from the last two slides. And then we have the reference from um, the bear scar, which is uh, 85.28. And then the reference, um, excuse me, the bear scar to the tridal scar, uh, 86.23. So those are very similar to each other and kind of show that they're really, you know, not super close in composition. And then at Fish Creek, we got a diversity, a dissimilarity index of 92.81, which um, definitely meant that the bear scar and the reference at that Fish Creek site were pretty different from each other in terms of funnel composition. <clears throat> okay, this is a visually more fun to way to look at it than that like sad table. So um, we also got to look at treatments through the non-metric multidimensional scaling which um, is the non-metric MDMS plot here on the right hand of the screen. So what this does, it just arranges points on a plot to distance among pairs of points correlate to dissimilarity between the two samples. So not surprising, the scar of the detritus and the reference very close to each other. They're like overlapping and really kind of on the same sphere. And then we have the bear, the bear scars very different from the other two all along the outside. Um, 
And we also, just to see if statistically this book's significant, we address the community assemblage by habitat using a PermaNova. Um, we got a p-value of 0 0.053, so not, we use a p-value of 0 0.05, so not technically significant, but very, very close. And this was driven by the bear scar being different by the being different than the reference. <clears throat> so lastly, we also got to just look at percent abundance um, of epifauna and fauna in these three different treatment types. So um, we have epifauna here in the blue and infauna here in the red. And we can kind of see that the reference and scar with detritus fall very similar to each other in terms of these proportions. We have a lot of epifauna and a little bit of infauna around, looks like 18% and maybe like 23%. Um, and this dramatically flips. So we have a bare scar, we have a lot less epifauna and a lot more infauna. Um, and this, if you kind of think about it, does logically make sense. You know, the small epifauna that is maybe used in the seagrass to hide from predators or as a food source would probably be avoiding these bear scars and they're going to be way less abundant. Um, and then just the most common species that was found in the bear scars was an infaunal species, so a polychaete. And then for the scars with the detritus and the reference, we had epifaunal mitrella lunata and an epifaunal gastropod, excuse me, amphipod. <clears throat> okay, so still looking at different faunal communities between the reference meadow and sea, um, seagrass propeller scars, we wanted to look at colonization potential. And we use this using artific artificial seagrass units. And I'm for the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna abbreviate them by just calling them ASUs. Um, so we made these in the lab ourselves. We did that by attaching um, this green polypropylene ribbon to like a hardware cloth. And we did it to mimic the um, canopy that's at these sites. So we mimicked canopy height and density. And um, we placed these ASUs within the bear scars so we did one at Fish Creek and one at Sandy Hook, and then we placed four ASUs the five meters away in the adjacent seagrass bed. Um, and these ASUs were anchored into the cement sediment using metal garden stakes, and they all stayed. Um, they were really secure. And unfortunately, the, we hoped that the incubation time between the two were going to be identical. But for those who do field work, know that <laughs> logistically that it sounds easy, but it's not when you have to plan for a day to go out in the field. So they're slightly different. ASUs were incubated for 27 days at Fish Creek and 48 days at Sandy Hook. Um, but then how we collected these is when we were at the site, we put a um, spat bag over the ASUs and slowly brought it to the surface. So we were catching all the fauna that was um, colonizing these ASUs. Um, just a brief table. So when we analyzed these, the faunal density was honestly low in both of them. So we didn't do a bunch of analyses to kind of look at this, but we did look at density um, and diversity of what was colonizing their ASUs. So in both terms of density and diversity at both sites, none of these were significantly different, but we definitely did see a trend that um, ASUs that were put out in the reference did have more faunal density. So we have an average of 133 per meter, 76, and they did have about the same diversity. So we weren't really seeing big differences between the two. Um, and this kind of confirms the idea of once the structure was added back into the environment, they really weren't that all, all that different from each other. So the species readily came back and colonized these ASUs didn't really matter if it was in the scar or the reference. Um, and this is like a positive thought when we think of restoration, you know, for putting something back out there to try to fill in these um, propeller scars, it's a good chance that these species are gonna come back quickly. And I mentioned in the last slide, we kind of didn't replicate this um, a ton. And so definitely this is an area where it'd be interesting to see this on a larger scale and we might be able to pull out some larger trends. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to switch gears a bit. So that was all kind of small fauna based. Um, and now we're going to talk about uh, predation potential. So to investigate predator prey interactions in these propeller scars in, in the intact meadow, 
we measured rates of predation on standardized prey units. Um, we called them squid pops because that was what they're called in the method we used. Um, Duffy at all 2015 had created this method of using standardized prey units with um, dried pieces of circular squid. And that is tethered to a fiberglass stake using a monofilament fishing line. So you can kind of see it here. I have a better photo for you guys in a minute. But we use these um, squid pops and we analyze a total of 16 scar and reference pairs throughout the region. Um, and we did this in a time period of 12 months. So we analyzed 10 at Fish Creek and six at Sandy Hook. Um, and then each one of these scars, we put 12 experimental prey units um, 1.5 meters apart within the scar. And then five meters away, we replicated that same setup in the intact seagrass meadow. And then we placed six GoPro cameras, um, which we attached to PVC to record the squid consumption. And these tethers were left out for one hour. And then after an hour, um, we would go back in, collect them, record the number of squid consumed off the squid pops. And then back at the lab, we looked at the GoPro footage separately and we were able to analyze the time to first bite and what species were consuming the squid. <clears throat> so this is kind of just what our transect looks like. So you can kind of see that we have these um, squid pops placed all along this transect of the scar. <clears throat> And I hope this works because this is a really cool video of what this actually looks like in the field. Okay, so um, here you can see we have this GoPro captured two squid pops. <clears throat> so we have one here, one here. Um, this is in the scar. You can kind of see that there's no seagrass here in the middle. And actually the visibility is so great that if you really look, you can see the GoPros for the reference. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, you can see the cute little pinfish trying to get at the squid. <clears throat> oh. Okay. So um, I apologize at first glance this graph kind of, bar graph is kind of a lot, but it really does have a lot of information at it. So I'll explain it real quick. So um, what this is really looking at is squid consumption in the scar versus the reference meadows. So on the y-axis, we have squid consumption um, and we have zero representing that if there's no graph and the bar graph is at zero, that means consumption between the two treatments was equal. If it's above the data line, it was higher in the scar. And um, the number tells you how much higher. So here, um, it looks like this treatment in February was about five times high, excuse me. There was five more squid pops consumed in the scar than the reference meadow. And then below the data line, which means that in that trial, consumption was higher in the reference. Um, so, on the x-axis, we have when the trial took place. So we have, you can see we did multiple triers, trials a month for most of the time. And then just for colors, the x black, the x bars represent Fish Creek and the red bars represent Sandy Hook. Okay, so there's a lot going on in this graph, but basically if you look at it, you can kind of pull out that there really isn't any type of trend. Um, and uh, this was confirmed statistically too. We used anomial logistics regression to test consumption against treatment. So that's SCAR versus reference. And site, which is Fish Creek versus Sandy Hook. And we found that there was no significant trends um, with either of these. <clears throat> but since we had the GoPro footage, we could also analyze how quickly predators were finding the squid and taking their first bite. Um, this is important because if you recall from that video that I just showed you, many of the small predators like pinfish, which were very common in this area, it took them a bit to kind of finally remove the squid. They'd be like working on it and maybe some more would come in and they'd finally detach, you know, the squid from the tether. So this graph here is a parametric survival fit of the chance that a squid would be consumed over time. So the y axis is the survival of the squid, which is just like the odds that the squid is still on the tether. 
So at time one here, um, excuse me, time zero, we see a one, which is 100% that the squid is on the tether. As time goes on, of course, the survival decreases. Um, and results here, we have the gray indicated that it was in the scar and the green that the tethers were in the reference. And we can kind of see that they're pretty identical. There's not much variation between the two. Um, and then in both habitats, squid were consumed on an average of 31 to 32 minutes. So pretty identical from each other. <clears throat> um, we also looked at location. So we did the same analysis for scar location. So in this figure, the squid pops in the um, scars in reference were compared against site. So we have this red for Sandy Hook, this black for Fish Creek. Um, and so while at the last slide, scars uh, location, excuse me, did not significant, excuse me, treatment did not significantly influence consumption rate, we see that scar and location actually did. So um, the amount of time it took a predator to take their first bite in Fish Creek was 29 minutes. And at Sandy Hook, it was almost about a full 10 minutes later. Um, we see in the parametric survival fit is significant and these two are significantly different from each other. And if you recall to my site slide, I mentioned that these two sites, while geographically very close, had a lot of differences. And one of those big differences was turbidity. Um, Sandy Hook, which was the uh, closest inshore, often had really bad visibility to the point where, unfortunately, sometimes the GoPro footage was actually unusable. So as you can see from the screenshot, this was a screenshot of some of our GoPro footage, you can't even see the tethers. You can kind of see the transect here in this white line, but yes, not, not clear water at all. While Fish Creek, on the other hand, always had amazing great visibility. And you can see the screenshot here, everything's really clear. And one of the main consumers of our squid pops um, were pinfish and pinfish are a known visual predator. So it does make sense that perhaps the increasing water turbidity that we saw at Sandy Hook did decrease their time to first bite. <clears throat> um, and with the GoPro footage, we also got a glimpse into who the top squid consumers were. So um, as we see from this table, consumers varied by site and they also kind of differed by treatment too, which was cool. So uh, Sandy Hook, we had a lot less <laughs> consumer diversity. It was solely made up of pinfish and the Southern puffer fish. Um, and they were pretty equal between scars and reference. You know, we had the Southern puffer fish as the top competitor in both and then the pinfish in second. But at Fish Creek, we see the top squid consumer differ between the scar and reference meadow, which was interesting. So within the reference meadow, Pinfish was the dominant here at the 55.56%, and it was followed by the Southern Puffer. Um, while in the propeller scar, we see that spot tail pinfish was the um, highest with the 44.83%. And which is weird because when we looked at spot tail pinfish in the reference, they only accounted for 6.6% .6 of the consumption, which is a big difference. Um, so trying to think about what this means, if this actually means something, or if this was a coincidence, you know, ultimately we need more information. Uh, there's unfortunately a, not a lot known about the foraging and feeding behavior of spot tail finfish. Um, so we don't really know if they're like a go-to visual predator, like normal pinfish are. Um, if they are, it could be that the, um, reference just the fact that there's a lot of seagrass around it hindered their ability to find the prey or perhaps they just enjoyed using the habitat edge to forage you know some um we've seen that some fish species seem to like that so there's a lot of cool um, additional room for research that can definitely be kind of be teased out of future work that relates on what species are utilizing what areas <clears throat> um okay Lastly, I'm gonna to jump to the final of the three kind of components that we looked at, and that was sediment grain size and sediment nutrients. Um, just a boring methods of how we did this. We collected sediment um, in the bare scars of the adjacent intact seagrass meadow using a syringe core 
Um, and we divided those into two subsections. So we have a zero to five centimeter and a five to 10 centimeter subsection. And we were able to look at the particle size distribution between these two. Um, here at the University of Florida's Environmental and Podology Land Use Laboratory, they have a really impressive like a laser diffraction particle analyzer is what they call it. Um, and it's great and it can get really in-depth analysis of what particle size looks like. Um, and then we collected larger cores for sediment carbon, nitrogen, and organic matter analyses. So these cores we separated even further. So we have zero to 2.5, 2.5 to five and five to 10 centimeter steps that we looked at. Organic matter content was estimated through the traditional loss and ignition method, then carbon and nitrogen was um, measured here at UF's wetland biogeochemistry lab. Um, and then we also took additional sediment cores to calculate bulk density of the sediment. And since we had bulk density, we were able to look at the total nitrogen, total carbon um, in terms of sediment stocks. <clears throat> Apologies. Okay. So what we found was that scarring had a clear significant influence on sediment texture. So on each one of these graphs, the y-axis represents the sediment size, or excuse me, sediment layers of depth. So we have zero to five at the top and five to 10 centimeters at the bottom. And then the y-axis is the percent um, sediment type. So we have sand, silt, and clay by volume. Um, so speaking of sand first, so what we found was that sand was sand content and texture was significantly higher in the scars. Um, so here's scar and the gray. We can see a lot more sand um, than in the reference. And then on the opposite side, silt was significantly lower in the scars. So we have more fine grained sediment in the reference and um, more large grained sediment in the scar. And then clay did not significantly vary, but clay is super, super fine and it accounted for a very low percentage of our sediment. Um, so if we look at the uh, x-axis, we can see that, you know, it was less than 1% of our samples. <clears throat> So a better way to kind of look at this was this visualization here of what the sediment looked like. So um, on the y-axis, we have the percent volume of grain size. And then on the x-axis, the particle diameter. Um, so this is this area that is really different between the scar and the reference. And this is um, about grain size, 125 to 250 microns, which is considered like a fine grain sand. So um, this follows the trend that we have more large grain sediments um, within the scar and fewer fine grain sediments within the reference. And excuse me, fewer fine grain sediments within the scar. Um, and this makes sense. When you think of a uh, propeller scarring occurring, the finer sediment is likely to be exported and without any plant biomass to kind of keep sediment in place, the idea that finer sediment is going to be continually exported over time makes sense. So um, the fact that the scars had less silt and clay kind of keep with this idea. <clears throat> um, and we also got to look at organic matter, total nitrogen, total carbon at these depths between these two treatments. Um, so same as the last graphs. Um, here in these graphs, we have depth again on the y-axis, but this is now into three depth categories, 0 to 2.5, um, 2.5 to 5, and 5 to 10. And then at the x-axis, we have either percent organic matter, total nitrogen in grams per kilogram, or total carbon in grams per kilogram. And um, starting with organic matter, we saw that this um, samples had around a 46.97% less organic matter in the scarred samples than the reference samples, which is a lot. So it's about a, almost a, you know, 50% decrease the amount of organic matter available. Um, and obviously it was, you know, there was a significant trend through all three of these depths. <clears throat> So total nitrogen in the scar was a reduced around 14%. So like organic matter, total nitrogen was significantly lower in the scar than in the reference. But unlike organic matter, total nitrogen, and we see the same with total carbon, we don't see significance at individual depths. 
So it's significant as a whole, but not, there wasn't a single depth that we're like, oh, it's a lot, lot lower. <clears throat> so um, it's a bit more even across the board between the total nitrogen and total carbon. And for total carbon, we saw a reduction around 15.36%. So um, we see in the top 10 centimeters uh, that, excuse me, overall <laughs> significantly lower, but there was not, again, like total nitrogen at any particular depth that really kind of stood out to us. Um, so additionally, with the total carbon levels, we saw that within the zero to 2.5 and the 2.5 to five, so these top ones here, they had um, significantly more total carbon in their top layers than the five to 10. So we know scarring influences these top layers of sediment, and that's where a lot of this total carbon is being found, which was definitely very interesting to see. <clears throat> so since the five to 10 centimeters, we're still seeing in all three of these instances, um, lower quantities of organic matter, total nitrogen, total carbon, and we only measure to 10 centimeters, we can kind of guess that these reductions are extending further into the sediment profile than 10 centimeters. Okay. I'm gonna put this all here at once. I apologize, this is a lot of, lot of text on this slide, um, but I just wanna kind of, you know, the last slide, it's cool to look at, but it doesn't really give an idea of what this impact actually means. So we had the ability to kind of look at what this actually meant for this area, like how much of these nutrients are we losing total? So to kind of estimate how this is a larger impact than maybe on the small scale that we're thinking of, we looked at how many of, um, how much nutrients are being lost in Citrus County alone. So there's um, a few good papers that looked at the amount of scarring that had occurred in Citrus County. So we kind of used the estimates from that paper and they found that approximately 15.8% um, of the uh, 147,000 acres of seagrass that Citrus County has um, shows evidence of scarring. And then 93% of that shows evidence of light scarring, which is less than 5% damaged. Um, we used an estimate of 3% to kind of, you know, keep it conservative and not try to go over what they were saying. Um, but that meant a total of 1,028 total acres of seagrass had been lost. Um, this is light scarring alone. We didn't even take into account the um, other 7%. <clears throat> because we calculated both density of the sediment, we were also able to estimate the top 10 centimeters of soil in Citrus County and how much total nitrogen there are actually holding. So we estimated that they're holding around 207 grams per meter squared of total nitrogen in the top 10 centimeters. So last slide, I told you we estimated that this meant about 14.21% reduction between scar and reference meadows. And then doing some math, uh, we were able to estimate that that is around 123 metric tons of total nitrogen lost in Citrus County. And like I said, that's due to light scarring alone to keep this conservative, and we used a conservative es estimate of 3%. So to kind of understand what this means, you know, what is 123 metric tons, uh, that's about the untreated nitrogen waste of like 25,000 people. So that is a lot of total nitrogen that is being re-released into the water column due to scarring. And we looked at, you know, following the same step-by-step -step logic, um, we estimated that around 3,124, um, that should also be metric tons, I apologize, of total carbon is stored in the top, or grams per meter, yeah, grams per meter squared, sorry. Um, so in the top 10 centimeters of, uh, total carbon stored in the top 10 centimeters. And this reduction is around 15.3%. And then totaling 1, 1,996 metric tons lost. So um, not necessarily as much as, you know, when we start thinking of blue carbon and how much that holds, but it still is about a year's worth of emission from 417 cars. So these numbers 
while not huge in the scheme of the global planet, um, this is just one county in Florida. And as I mentioned, we took very conservative estimates. So it's likely that these are a lot higher when we take into account the um, medium and high scarring. And also, you know, this estimate was a, from a few years back and it's likely that scarring has increased in the area and these could even be even higher. <clears throat> okay. So I wanna kind of summarize it because I've gone through three different areas and these areas are all a little different from each other. So just to kind of summarize what we found was um, scurrying the seagrass meadows led to reduction in epifaunal and faunal density. It also lowered species diversity and significantly changed community compositions from the intact uh, seagrass scars compared to the reference meadows. We found that scarring did not influence predation potential and that between the two sites, they were equal. So we did find changes in predation site related, but not because of the scar itself. And that scarring had lowered um, sediment, organic matter, total nitrogen and total carbon, and also um, lowered the amount of fine grained particles found in the sediment. <clears throat> um, and just like any master's project, of course, this is totally not done alone. So there's a lot of acknowledgement to be had from my advisors, um, Laura Reynolds and Todd Osborne, and to all my committee members, Savannah um, Barry and Charlie Martin. And of course, the, all the field help that this took to kind of collect. And then specifically the UF's Environmental Pathology Land Use Lab, who was gracious enough to do our particle size analyses for us. Um, and I will leave that with questions. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. Um, yeah. Cool work. Uh, <laughs> um, even if I am a little biased. Um, does anyone have it any questions? It was a lot to cram into 50 minutes. I apologize. I started talking fast at the end. <laughs> That's okay. Anybody have any questions? You're welcome to type them into the chat or to unmute yourself um, and ask uh, Teresa directly. I. I have a question um, while people are, are thinking of their questions. Um, you found that detritus is really important. Um, can you talk a little bit about like how long detritus might stick around in those in those propeller scars? Yeah, so I think like the unfortunate question is we kind of don't know. And that's when even looking through to see if there was any other papers that had looked at seagrass detritus um, in scars, there wasn't, you know, this is something that hasn't really been looked at, um, but did seem to make like a huge difference in what was kind of happening in these scars. Um, I think the time of year when we found the detritus did matter. So unfortunately we were kind of wanting to investigate this further. When we went back out, we just couldn't find these um, scars filled in again. Uh, so I don't know how long they stay, but I do think it'd be, I like, I want to see more work on that done in the future. Like if other people, you know, have research questions and focus on that, because I think it is really cool and it's not something that we kind of think about a lot. So. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, in the chat, um, Alex asked, did you happen to measure differences in organic matter, total nitrogen, total carbon in the detrital field scars too? If not, um, what do you think you would see? Yeah, no, we didn't. So that is unfortunate. So a lot of this kind of, we had step by steps of what we were gonna look at. And then the trial impact kind of came later. And then we were like, take a step back to kind of look at these different influences. So unfortunately the two metrics that I have was just the bear scar and the reference. Um, so obviously I personally think organic matter would be different if we are seeing any type of decomposition of this detritus, I'm sure is adding some type of organic matter back into the sediment. Um, which would be beneficial because that was the one that had the biggest differences between the two. Um, and in terms of total nitrogen, total carbon, I don't know. I would wonder if it, we could, I mean, if it's, you know, encouraging new plant growth. So if we're seeing that a trital matter is maybe encouraging more growth of seagrass into the scar than maybe, but I don't actually know if it would make that big of a difference just by being there, so. 
We have a couple more questions coming into the mm -hmm. chat. Um, one was, was your Fish Creek study inside of the creek or outside the mangroves? And in, inside, do you think that contributed to the lack of detrital filled scars? Um, it was in, so it was basically probably maybe not the safest spot, but it was right outside the channel. So we were not by the mangroves at all. It was pretty open water. Um, and what was the second part of that question? Um, do you think that contributed to the lack of detrital filled scars? The location? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so probably. So that was the site that we couldn't find any detrital filled scars, which is unusual because that area had a lot it seemed it has more dense the last year, so you would think, you know, it would kind of fill in. But I do think the higher wave energy, the increased like tidal regime definitely probably pushed that in and out more. We're closer inshore, which the Sandy Hook site is kind of where we're seeing a lot of that settling of detrital matter. So I agree. I think that did influence it. Cool. And um, Savannah asked, did you see any hints of differences in the species that colonize the ASUs between scars and reference? Basically, he's asking where there's certain species that came back first um, in the scar. Yeah, so that was one of the we plan to look at community composition for the ASUs. Um, that was definitely on the docket to look at. And as I mentioned, the density just wasn't high. We didn't, I think max, we were maybe getting like 11 species all around. Um, and so when talking about using that type of analysis, we didn't just, we didn't have a high enough um, density to kind of get an appropriate look at community composition. It would have been very skewed. Um, so that's why I was like, I think the ASUs are great. And, you know, for future research, they definitely, there's a lot more that could be done with them because, you know, even though we had them out for a really long time, you know, we had a pretty long incubation period, but there might be ways to kind of, you know, look at different colonization and try to figure that out more. Cool. We have another couple of questions popping up. Um, do you think there's strong similarities between edge habitat and the bear scars in the same um, in terms of fauna predation and sediment? Yeah, um, we kind of, when I was looking at previous work that had been done, it's a little bit all over the place, I'm going to say. If you look at people who have done edge habitat um, work in seagrass, some people definitely find that like, oh, this species loves the edge and like, you know, or this species actively avoids it. So I think that what we found maybe I don't know if we have a close enough comparison to say like, yes, this is replicating edge habitat, you know, because we're talking about max, you know, maybe 40 centimeters. Um, I think that would be an interesting comparison for the future to kind of see what species, you know, are utilizing it, what aren't. I do think because we saw so much in faunal presence um, in the bear scars, that that kind of is representative of an edge habitat of, you know, species that are looking for food and for safety, like um, amphipods specifically, they're not, they didn't want to utilize that area. They're going to be like where the seagrass is. So kind of similar, but I think there's a lot more work to be done to like kind of look into that. <clears throat> um, we're almost out of time, but I think we have time for the, for one more question that's yeah. in the chat. Um, in our scar restoration work in St. Joe um, Bay, and this is from Megan, um, we've seen larger predators, flounder rays, et cetera, utilizing the scars either to rest in or to travel along. Have you yes. observed anything similar in your area? And do you have any insight of effects on natural predation events in scars? Okay, so we, I have heard that too, when people have talked about like, oh, this is what we looked at and fishermen too. I feel like told us that they like noticed that fish kind of use that as a highway. Mm -hmm. um, originally when I was thinking about analyzing the GoPro footage, that is exactly what we wanted to do to see like what species were utilizing it. Unfortunately, if you recall from the video, the way it's set up, it's not aerial. You're looking at it, you know, you know, basically the top of the seagrass meadow. It was hard to quantify if like species were actually using the scar area more than the reference. You know, they're coming in and out. We couldn't count like that's the same pinfish or that's a new pinfish. Um, so just from our GoPro footage, I did not see any trends that different species were utilizing like the scar as like, you know, either a transportation highway or just like an area to hang out. But I do think that could easily, you know, be a good cool analysis, you know, 
if just placing the GoPros in a different way, we could definitely look at like how they're utilizing it, not just in terms of a food source. <clears throat> yeah. And one more popped up. <laughs> so any <laughs> idea of how long scars were there? Um, were they recent scars or had they been there for yeah. a long time? So we did our best to try to find scars that quote unquote are recent. So if they were starting to fill in, a lot of times they'll fill in with like um, macroalgae, maybe first like a Calerpa species and you'll start to get maybe like Serangodium popping up in there. We try to avoid them. Obviously we're not out creating the scars ourselves. That'd be terrible. So we have no idea when they were created. Um, but like I said, we definitely looked for scars that had a pretty clean <laughs> middle area. So we don't know when they were created, but hopefully in general, all the scars were relatively new. I would say like, you know, within the past year or two. So. Great. Well, um, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, I think we're about out of time and I want to be respectful of everyone's yes. time, but um, this is great. We had a lot of good conversations. I think it's a, a topic of of um, general interest and Teresa's email is up there. If we didn't get to your question, I'm sure that she'd be happy to respond to it um, later. Um, and thank you guys all for being here and um, hope to see you back um, next month when we go back to Crystal Bay and look at um, algal and seagrass inter interactions. Yes, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you.